Gracious Heavenly Father, we come into your presence now knowing that you are a good and gracious God who delights to hear the prayers of your people. We have praised you. We have confessed our sin. We have thanked you for the, what you have given us and have given back to you. And God, we ask now that you would hear all our prayers in Christ's name. Father, we do pray that you would be with those who have upcoming procedures. Father, we pray that your hand would be upon uh, Joe Green and Betty Folsom this week. We pray that you would give them a peace that transcends all understanding. Guard them. Guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Father, we, we, we thank you for successful surgeries from, for Ellen Green and Jack Fudge and for um, Fred Justice. God, we thank you so much for how you care for us when we're sick. Lenore, God, we do lift up all those in our congregation who are suffering with sickness, Father. It seems like families continue to just fall one by one. Uh, Father, we pray that you would restore them to full health. Lord, we also just pray uh, again for unity in our body. Lord, as we heard already, it is good and pleasing when your saints dwell in unity. We pray that that would be the case. Father, we also just pray for the purity and holiness of our body. Father, we pray that we would fight against sin, that you would allow us to be righteous in your sight. Father, we pray that we would not live under condemnation, but we would live in the hope of the gospel of Christ. Father, we pray specifically this morning for our children. God, we pray that you would take their hearts, plant the seed of faith, and make them alive with you. We pray for our youth, God, both our middle and high school students. We pray, God, that they would not be uh, seduced by this world. For the things in this world are not of you. Father, we pray that you would help them understand that all good things come from your hand. Let them pursue you. Let them set their mind on the things that are above. Father, we do pray that the gospel would, would go forth in the Dominican Republic today. We thank you so much for the, the strong gospel preaching there. Um, uh, Miguel Nunez and um, Suhail Michelin, God, we thank you so much for their faithfulness. We pray you would expand their influence and more and more people in that, in that uh, country would, would fall under the hearing of the gospel and repent and believe. Father, we, we do pray for our own nation. God, we pray for our uh, governors across our states. God, as they lead and govern our individual states, we pray, God, that you would give them wisdom, uh, that they would govern in a way that would, would honor you, Lord that they would not do things for their own benefit or to pad their own pockets, but they would do th- and live in a w- and, and govern in such a way to uh, serve and bless your people. Uh, Father, we, we thank you so much for the gospel preaching in other, other area churches today. We thank you so much for North Rock Hill. God, we pray for Chad Merrill as he preaches the word today. We pray that you would fill him with your spirit, allow him to teach faithfully and uh, winsomely in a way that the, the word of God would fall on fertile soil and reap a harvest. Father, now we come into this sacred hour where the people of God uh, hear, hear your word. God, we pray that we would hear your word gladly, that we would not put up barriers in our hearts and then defenses against you. God, we would, pre- we, we would see you for all that you are. Uh, Father, we pray now that you would um, allow me to decrease, that you may increase, that every word that I say would be said in a way and in a tone that honors you. We pray that you would take this offering, this offering of your word, and you would multiply it that you would allow it to bear fruit in 30 to 60 to 100 of what is sown. We pray that you would use this to edify and strengthen your church, to call sinners to repentance, and to bring glory to your name. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Point number one, Jesus goes to the hopeless. Jesus goes to the hopeless. Look again with me in John chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, this is the third sign that we're looking at in the Gospel of John, and as, we, as we've already seen, the first two signs kind of occur during a festival uh, period. Uh, this also occurs during a festival. We don't know exactly which festival. Uh, John did not give us that information. But there was a reason, there was a purpose that God had to go to Jerusalem. Jesus was living his normal everyday life, yet doing it with a purpose. We may not be doing miracles each and every day, but God has called us to do good works as we live each and every day. Like the Good Samaritan, if our eyes are open, we will find opportunities to do good to others as we go about our daily life. We just have to take our eyes 
off of ourselves and focus on the Lord and the others around us so we don't miss these opportunities. Jesus was one who took advantage of every opportunity he had to minister to those around him. Verse 2, now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethsaida, which was which has five roofed colonnades. John provides very specific details of the pool and what it looked like, the, the colonnades and where it was and what it was, what it was called. Now, although these details are not essential for us to understand the story, I think it's helpful to remind us that Jesus' ministry was done in, in a real place, in a real time, in real history. Jesus is not a myth, and His miracles were not mere legend. It is rooted and grounded in history. So every time you see these historical facts, as you, as you read through the, the Old Testament and, and the Gospels, especially the book of Acts, every time you see them, train your mind to think that Jesus is true, to believe in the historicity of Jesus Christ. Verse 3, it says, In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. Beloved, these were outcasts. They were the weak, the diseased, the, the broken. Now, there has always been and there always will be in our world stigma to go to those who are different, even more with those who have physical deficiencies. See, John's gospel has given us several reasons, as, he, as, he, as we'll see as the, as the text goes on, why these ailments are allowed to, to affect the children of, of men. Now, we know that all physical deficiencies are at least in part because of the fall. The Bible said God created the world good, and everything in it was very good. And yet sin came into the world and has more effects than we could possibly imagine. The curse of sin goes deep. And it affects every area of life. We do not know why each ailment is given. That why, why is someone blind? Why is someone lame? Why is someone paralyzed? But we know that in every deficiency, God has a purpose. For God never moves without purpose. I think this is a helpful reminder for us. Whatever deficiency you think that you have... Know this, God is using that deficiency for a purpose, to, to mold you more like Himself and to give Himself glory. Now, in some of your Bibles, there's uh, a footnote. In that footnote, it, it says uh, John 5, 3b, or John 4, it says, in some manuscripts, the text says this. It says, waiting for the moving of the water, for the angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred the water. Whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was healed of whatever disease he had. Now that's a footnote in the international English Standard Version. In the King James Version, it's included in the text. So you have to ask yourself, why is it not included in all Bibles? Well, there are over 5,000 manuscripts of the Bible, both uh, partial fragments and, and full manuscripts, what, what, what textual critics and translators, they do is they take all these manuscripts and they lay them out and they, they try to say, what is a, the tr most trustworthy copy or words in our language to understand? The footnotes here are given to help us understand the differences in, in certain manuscripts. Uh, the ESV chose not to include this in the Bible, while other translators did. The ESV and others didn't include it because it was not in the earliest manuscripts. They believed it was added as kind of like a parenthesis from someone who was doing an, an edit or a, a kind of a clarification of something later on in the text. Later on, it says that he, the, 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 the man who was an invalid couldn't get in the water when it was stirred. And the, the ones who were originally reading this, what, what, what would someone understand if they were reading that? So they kind of, kind of filled in what people believed at the time, that they believed that the angel of the Lord was stirring the waters that if a, the first one who came in was healed. That was the, the popular reason. Now, I only bring that, to, that up to say this. We have to be careful and thoughtful readers of the Scripture. Now, this passage is, is not a, a controversial one. 
as you read even later in the text, the, this editorial note kind of makes it clear this is the reason why the invalid wanted to go into the water. And yet there are other passages that were not in the earliest manuscripts that you will have to decide for yourself whether you believe that they are the very Word of God. Because for us, the Word of God is essential. We are willing to die for the Word of God. We have to follow the Word of God to its fullest because it is God breathed. So in certain passages that are not in the earliest manuscripts, you have to decide, should I consider that to be the very Word of God? The most um, obvious ones or the most well-known, most popular would be John 7, 53 to John 8, 11, the woman who's caught in adultery or the end of the Gospel of Mark, Mark 16, 9 through 20. Uh, the first time I've, I, I addressed that with people, people thought I was a heretic. Uh, they thought I didn't believe in the Bible. Uh, but what I'm trying to do is I want to have a very high view of the Scriptures. We have to wrestle with what is in the earliest manuscripts, not based on our traditions in terms of what we were taught, but when we look at the earliest manuscripts, what were the words that were there? These questions are crucial. Because if we want to base our life on the Word of God, we have to be knowledgeable of what the Word of God is and what is it, it is not. So we look at this passage and we think we see this hopeless. There are people who are lying beside the pool that didn't really have any hope. They were believing and they were trusting in a hope, this superstition, that when the water stirred, if we were able to get in, we would be healed. They had hope, but it was a misplaced hope. It was not a sure hope. Therefore, I would call them hopeless. And I wonder how many people here today in this gathering have a misplaced hope like these blind, lame, and paralyzed. It may not be a, a, a physical, but a spiritual misplaced hope. How many of you are hoping to be forgiven of your sins because you're a good person? Or how many are you hoping that your good deeds in your life will outweigh your bad? There are so many people whose hope is mere superstition. It's not real. It will not heal. It will not save. So I guess the question is, do you have a misplaced hope to be healed of your sin. Well, the second thing we see here in the text, Jesus comes with healing. He comes to the hopeless with healing. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus does not come with mere words, but he comes with power. The hope he offers is not a mere wish or a or superstition, but is the sure and steady anchor in the midst of the storm. John 5, 5 says, One man was there, who had been an invalid for 38 years. I mean, pause for a moment. Try to connect yourself with this man. Think on, on how many challenging things he had in his life in the first century. How many snickers? How many long stares? How many times he heard people whispering about him as he passed? How many times he himself would ask the question, why? Why, God? Or his family, why, God? Try to empathize with his pain. He is lying there in verse 6 when Jesus saw him. Can I just stop for a second and just say this? Jesus sees you. Whatever you're dealing with, Jesus sees you. Jesus saw this man lying there and knew that he had already been there for a long time. And he said to him, do you want to be healed? I mean, Jesus is full of, of compassion. This man has a misplaced hope. And Jesus comes to him and asks, do you want to be healed? It's a question that you could ask some of us today. Our wounds may not be seen, they may be hidden, but they're hidden deep. And Jesus may be coming to you to say, do you want to be healed? John 
5, 7, the sick man answered Jesus to his question, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. Now we see another detail of this man's life. I mean, he's alone. You know, I mean, if he had a family member or a friend, when the water starts, someone could get, bring him there. But no, he was alone. And one of the saddest things in life when we are alone without friends or family or fellowship. But I want you to notice that he doesn't answer Jesus' question. Jesus says, do you want to be healed? And he didn't answer. I mean, are you like this man when Jesus comes to you and says, do you want to be healed? And, and we reply with how our circumstances are impossible to be changed. This man is focused on his problems and his circumstances, not on the God that stands before him. Friends, this is his and this is our fatal mistake. Too often we, we look at our circumstances rather than on the God that is before us. Whether it's because of your family dynamics, uh, your chronic pain, uh, your, your sinful habit, your physical appearance, your, your difficult job, your singleness, your, your childlessness, your financial stress, or whatever dominates your thoughts and your mental anguish. Friend, you must not focus on your circumstances, but on our God who stands before you and says, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? The healing that is offered is far beyond and far better than we can imagine. Notice that this man didn't answer the question. And what did Jesus say to him? John 5, 8. Jesus said to him, Get up! Take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed. And he took up his bed and walked. Boom! Boom! Jesus comes again, speaks a word, and life change happens. This man who was an invalid for 38 years in a moment is changed. As one scholar notes, just as the 38 years prove the gravity of the disease, so the carrying of the bed and the walking prove the completeness of the cure. Jesus is not like others who make empty promises. But when Jesus offers healing, he can actually deliver it. How does Jesus offer true and complete healing to us? By trading his life for us. Jesus is perfect, without defect or deceit. He came to earth to offer a trade. He came to offer healing by, by trading his perfect obedience for our lifelong spiritual paralysis. He went to the cross as the perfect sacrifice to, to pay for all of our sins and whoever would repent and trust in him. He was crucified, dead, and was buried, taking the sting of death not only to conquer the grave, but only to conquer the grave and the resurrection. He metaphorically was, was saying, I got up, picked up my mat, and walked out of the tomb. And when he did, he proved that the healing he offers is full, complete, and everlasting. This is the only one that can offer and deliver on healing. But that word get up is a, is a foreshadowing to, to John chapter 11 and the calling forth of Exodus. Beloved, that is a, a, a foreshadowing and a foretaste. When God says one day when he, when he er returns, he's going to say to his saints, get up! And all of us are going to walk out of our tombs and we are going to assemble under the lordship of Christ. But I want you to notice that this, is, this does not depend on this man's faith. It seems as in the text he doesn't have any. This depends on the power of God. God opens the eyes of the blind. God heals the lame. God changes paralysis. It is on the basis of his mercy. Beloved, one day we will experience that mercy in full. So I just ask you again, do you want to be healed? Do you want true and everlasting hope? Stop looking at your circumstances. Stop looking at the amount of your sin. Stop looking at your deficiencies and look at the God who is before you who says, do you want to be healed? I will heal you. Get up. Trust in his death and his resurrection. Believe and be healed. 
Number three, Jesus warns of hell. Jesus warns of hell. That's number three, right? Okay. I'm like, is that number three or four? This is a long sermon already. Um, notice what it says here in John chapter 5, verse 9. Kind of the story continues. Because one thing I want you to see when you have the narrative of, of the Gospels is what's the point of John telling the story? Some would say John's trying to tell the story only for the, to tell us the healing. But it seems like it's almost anticlimactic. He tells the story and then it kind of goes on to this long diatribe to those who are surrounding. So just follow this narrative in verse 9. It says, And that once the man was healed and he took up his bed his walk. Now that, that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man, who had been healed. It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, the man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk. Now the man who had been healed did not know what, who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. The healing on the Sabbath is important for the rest of the narrative and really for the rest of Jesus's ministry. It is not a mere accident that this healing occurred on the Sabbath. It was intentional and it was purposeful. We'll get back to that in a second. Look at verse 14. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more. That nothing worse may happen to you. Now, we don't know the full reason why this man was physically impaired or it was an invalid for 38 years, uh, but Jesus seems to imply that his sin was part of the, the reason. Uh, we know in John 9, Jesus says the man was born blind was not his sin or the sin of his parents, but for the glory of God. Uh, God does bring consequences for our sin, and he allows consequences and physical ailments that are not caused by our sin. So sometimes we do not know the, the, the secret and hidden will of God. We don't know why God does or why God allows things in our life. He is God, and He does as He pleases. But when He does as He pleases, He always does it for our good, because He is a good, gracious, and kind Father. Jesus says two things to the man. He says, see, you are well. This would have been obvious. He was an invalid, and now he's walking. But Jesus is pointing out a reason for this man to trust him and a reason that John is pointing, uh, reason John is pointing out for us to trust in Christ, to believe that he is the Son of God and that by believing we may have life in his name. Not only life, but wellness in knowing Jesus is Lord. This man, as far as we have seen, does not have true faith in Jesus. But he says this, he says, sin no more. So see you are well, but then he says, sin no more, lest something worse may happen to you. There is something worse than being an invalid, staring, sitting at the side of a pool when people gawk and mock and ridicule you. There's something worse about being alone in this life. Now, Jesus could be referring to death here, physical death, his death may come. But Jesus is concerned with something that is far worse than physical death. Jesus alludes to the worst thing in all time and space, hell. Hell is a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, unquenchable fire, where the worm does not die, where the judgment of God is rightly and justly executed on sin for all eternity. It is an awful... No more. We know sin has consequences. It's deceptive. It's enticing. It is deadly. Run from your sin. Confess to God. Bring it to the light of, of the body of Christ so that you can have freedom. Hear this warning from Jesus. This is not a warning from the pastor. This is a warning from Jesus, the Son of God, who came and died for you and rose from the grave, who's coming back. This Jesus says to you, sin no more. That, nothing worse, may happen to you. Cling to the true hope of the gospel. Number four, Jesus claims homoousis. Yes, I said that out loud, right? You may want to write that word down, okay? That's going to be an important word as we finish this text. Let me begin in verse 15. Just leave it up there, whoever's doing the PowerPoint. They're going to need that to copy down. 
All right, verse 15. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them. Notice that they weren't really talking to Jesus. They are kind of talking about Jesus. But Jesus still answered them and said, My Father is working until now, and I am working. The man went and carried, uh, carried, carried more about his reputation and the fearing of the, the religious leaders more than honoring Christ. Uh, we so often do these things in, in, the life, in life because of fear of man rather than in fear of God. Uh, and Jesus showed that he has the power to heal in a clear way. Jesus was showing that he was the, the Messiah displaying the power of God. But to make matters crystal clear, he claims that he is one with God. Jesus says, my father is working until now and I am working. The, the word that Jesus claims, homoousis, is a word that was debated at the Council of Nicaea in 325 um, A.D., This states that Jesus was one and the same substance with the Father. There was a debate raging between uh, trying to uh, attack from Arian and Arianism that said that Jesus was truly human, but he was not truly divine. Uh, What this word, homoousis, says, literally of one substance, became the official doctrine of the church. This is a word worth knowing because it has saved the church from many heresies throughout the ages. Jesus Christ is truly human and truly and fully God. That's what Jesus is saying here. That's what the church believed and and, and ratified, codified in 325 A.D. at the Council of Nicaea. Nicaea. This is directly related to the Sabbath conversation of the Jews. Because the Jews believed that God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day. There was four kind of prominent uh, rabbis who, who recently had a discussion this early, in these early days based on some Jewish documents that said that God had to continue to work after on, on the Sabbath because God sustains and keeps the world in order forever. So even though he's maybe, he may be resting from his finished work because everything had been planned, God was still actively working on creation. So they knew that God the Father was working in creation. That was very commonly believed. And Jesus says, I am working too. My Father is working, and I am working. What he's saying is, I am one with the Father. Homoousis. And then he even uses that special word, my Father, implying this special relationship with God. So let me just say very clearly, do not believe the theological liberal propaganda that Jesus never claimed that he was God. That is clearly false. He does it right here. Lastly, Jesus receives hatred. Jesus receives hatred. John 5, 18. This is why the Jews were asking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, which again is debatable, they claimed he was, was breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. The Jews knew what Jesus was was saying, and they hated him for it. They were so wrapped up in their traditions. They didn't even pause to celebrate the miraculous healing of a man who was an invalid for 38 years, who got up, took his mat, and walked. You you can't walk on the Sabbath, sir. Not, you're walking. The power of God came, and it was clearly displayed, and they missed it. Why? Why? Did they hate Jesus? Jesus attacked what they viewed as precious. He attacked their traditions. He attacked their power. He upset their interpretation of life. He challenged and confronted their sin. I wonder, do we hate Jesus sometimes because of the same reasons? You would never say that we hate Jesus. That's a strong tone. What I'm saying is, We love Jesus by obeying his commands. So every time you don't obey the commands of Jesus, what you're actually doing is hating him. And then Jesus, the kind, sovereign God that he is, responds to their own hatred with truth. This passage kind of ends the chapter when Jesus kind of responds to these men. And um, we're kind of moving on to chapter 6 next week. So I figured we're just going to read the, the rest of the chapter. It's a long chapter, so I know this may be challenging at the end of a sermon, but guess what? We have a free lunch right after. 
okay? So let's just kind of read John um, chapter 5, verse 19 to the end of the chapter. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son of Man can do nothing on his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he is himself is doing. The greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but he passes from death to life. Basically, what Jesus is doing here, he is doubling down on his claim that he's one with the Father. They said, we should kill him because he says he's one with God. And Jesus says, oh, you thought that was good. Let me really tell you what I mean. Verse 25. Truly I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. Get up! And those who hear will, will live. For as the Father has, a, has, has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Get up! those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he bore, bore witnesses to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent." You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not receive glory from the, that comes from only God? Do not think that I, have, I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Friends, Jesus just claimed his divinity, his oneness with God. He showed that he has the power to heal, that he and he alone has the power to say, get up to dead hearts and be alive. He has the power to forgive because he is God. He shows it over and over again. You can believe his words by examining his deeds in the light of what his words and examining the light of what he did. The question for all of us today, and primarily those of you who do not yet know Christ, do you want to be healed? If we want healing, we must believe his words. If we do not believe his words, we hate him. So the question for all of us is, do we want healing or hatred? Which will you choose? Father, we pray that you would allow us to choose your healing. Help us understand the glory of Christ, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, now we have the, the great opportunity to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Uh, the Lord's Supper is a, is a picture of the healing that God gives. Uh, we have the bread and we have the cup. We have two things that, that symbolize nourishment and refreshment to our souls. We have the bread that symbolizes the body of Christ broken and on our behalf. We have the cup that revives and, and gives us life because Jesus spilled his blood for us. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this meal together as one body. 
uh, when you receive the, the cup and the bread, uh, the cup and the, um, the bread will be in, in, in two stacked cups. So just we're going to start with the bread and then move on to the cup, but make sure you take both uh, when you pull them out of the tray. I just want to make an invitation to those of you who are, who are here. Uh, the, the Lord's Supper is, is an invitation. It's an invitation for all of us who, who want healing. Uh, but this table is for those who have, have chosen to make Jesus Christ their great healer, their great Savior. Uh, so this table is for sinners, but it's for a particular kind of sinners, repentant sinners. If you have trusted in Christ, if you are a baptized believer and a member of...